like to uh, bring up uh, Charles Perry and have him take over the floor. He's going to uh, talk about what's going on in Austin. Let's give him a round of applause. groups that are actively engaged in the process, probably more than ever. You always hear it about elections. This is the most important one the country's ever had. This is, 216, the most important one the country's ever had. So what I thought I'd do a little bit, talk about a lot of different things and then leave question and answers as long as you need me. Uh, I'll be here as much as you want me to. Um, 84th session in Texas, I'll go through a recap, uh, tell you some things I think we need to be cognizant of in Texas going forward some big issues of the day that we're working on and where we're at. And then some things that I see Texas needs to always be fighting for and fighting them back against the federal government. <clears throat> the Air Force session was a good session. Um, it's always a good session when you have funding to fund state priorities. We did. Uh, it was a good session because we had a new statewide leadership. I had nothing against Rick Perry or any of that group. They were great people. He was very, very good to me, very loyal to me on a lot of policy initiatives. I supported him. But it was time for a change out, and our new guys came in energetic, ready to go, good ideas, and ready to move. And we came in on time. Budget was done early. Priorities were set early. Priorities were funded early. We left out of there the day we were supposed to. That happened, happened very much in recent years. $209.6 billion budget for the state of Texas. 209.6. Puts us about 12th to 14th largest economy in the world. Um, that breaks down real simple. About 8 percent of that budget is set before we ever show up. Through formula funding, constitutional requirements, statutory requirements, federal match, those maintenance of efforts that we signed up for in the state, it's already done. So you figure 17 percent of the budget is what we're working on to fund roads, bridges, incarceration corrections, all of the things that we want to take care of. In the budget, it breaks down real simple. About 80 billion, 75 to 80 billion range goes to higher public aid combined. 80 billion goes to uh, health and human services, nursing homes, entitlements, welfare, all of those systems that Texas has our participant growing in is about equal to. It's actually growing exponentially faster than any line on the budget. You've heard me talk before. It is the 800 pound gorilla in the room. This state, as well as the other 49 states, if we don't figure out how to revamp that, get people out of there that don't deserve or shouldn't be in there, and turn that dynamic around, there's not a state budget big enough anywhere in this country, nor is there a federal budget big enough in this country to manage that system. So that's a big issue. $800 million worth of border security. I'll give you a comparison. My first session as a House of Representative four years back, I believe the number was closer to $250 million. So you can see how much the state budget's resources has been uh, confiscated by lack of federal action, if you will. $800 million is a large chunk of money. $2.5 billion went to tax relief for franchise tax. Uh, we're going to have about 40 million people in this state before I die, way on the trajectory we're in. We've got to have jobs, education, infrastructure, water. Those are big priorities of the state. But jobs, anything we can do to encourage businesses coming to the state, we've got to do it. We've got to do it today. Franchise tax is one of those last remaining barriers that sets Texas apart from being probably the most business friendly environment that we can have as a country in the state. So we took 25% off of that. I had a bill that would guarantee that it would be gone in four years. We just settled on 25% this session in the expectation of going back to do that. Uh, personally, I had a base session. Uh, Patrick put me as chairman of Water Rule and Act. It's the first time that a chairman as a freshman senator has been granted. I was told that was a big deal. Didn't know it was a big deal, but it ended up being a pretty big deal for my counties. It could not have been a better committee to be a chairman of. Water rule and ag issues in my 51 counties are, are a consistent theme. I always tell people we have about four things that we need to be guarded of in Texas and we need to be working on solutions today. Water, the health and human service and top reforms that we've got to turn that dynamic around. Public school finance, how we distribute funding, not necessarily the amount, but how we actually spread it. Those are the challenges that we're going to face because of a court case coming out probably by the end of the year. Fourth thing is federal overreach. Those are things. I'll start with water. We are about 20 years ahead in water 
initiatives for this state that anybody in this room would recognize. Very encouraged. After I got the chairmanship, I was on a pretty much fast pass to, to try to figure out what water law looks like in Texas and how it works. We have put some things in place that are coming to fruition and continue to evolve where our water needs in Texas, truthfully, I can say with confidence, if they maintain the priority level they are, we should be able to meet our water needs for all the citizens of the state going forward. Specifically this year, we put in what's called aquifer storage and recovery, whereas if you have surplus waters in certain areas, or if it makes sense to do it, or if you develop unused water resources and you want to need to store it somewhere, we can now store that underground where it makes sense to. We lose more water through evaporation than we do use. So we have the legislation in place now to be able to store water underground when it makes sense to. Second thing everybody in here always talks about desalination of the Gulf water. We now have the legislation in place as of last session through my committee to actually go out into the 10 mile jurisdiction. I think they're talking about a pilot project about six miles out. But we have jurisdiction from the federal government to go out 10 miles of the state. We now have that legislation for permitting those companies that want to explore Gulf water desalination. Um, Corpus is actually coming online with a major desal plant, commercial grade desal plant. So we're, we're moving on that technology pretty good. Uh, there might be a door prize for those that are paying attention. There might be a pop quiz. But we have 2.6 billion, 7 billion, 2.7 billion acre feet of brackish water in the state to develop. That will become a major player for uh, water needs in the future. We actually have set up years in past, 2022, having all those formations documented, mapped, to figure out how they work. Are they feasible? Do they, do they, are they unusable? We actually expedited that by putting money in the budget to bring that up to 2016 for the four major brackish water aquifers. West of I-35, we've got a ton of brackish water. With property right considerations being on the front end of that, how we're going to come through that process, that will become our source of water, I think, for the next 100, 150 years. You know, if you've got a producer, I'm a property rights guy, anybody that sat through my water committee would tell you I probably killed more bills, didn't let them see the light of day over the property rights issue. That said, you've got a producer that sets on water, brackish water, 3,000 feet deep, there's no economic feasible to use that water. It's too expensive to get. But a municipality in the area might kill it. If they can pull it up, develop it, and store that water into a freshwater aquifer that all are pulling from today, then we can start having discussions about water banking and crediting producers for something they couldn't use but something that they possibly could use. So those are the things that Texas is moving for on the water. We're very, very positive about the water. Health and Human Services, we have to lead as a state. We have to come up with this plan. We've always heard the sound bites from political candidates specifically on the Republican side, beating their chest about, give us a block grant from the federal government, we can fix our Medicaid system. Give us a block grant, we can fix our nursing home care. We can do whatever. We never provide any detail. If I was sitting on the other end writing the check, I would say, I ain't giving it to you. I don't trust you no more than you trust me. So Texas has to begin the process of building a model for health care delivery, instant care delivery, nursing home delivery, from boots on the ground up instead of bureaucracy down. See, the problem with the Affordable Care Act, or at least many of the problems, but one of them was they started with the premise the bureaucrats should run it. You've got to go out here to the front lines and do it. I'm committed to trying to get that committee set up. I've got a few guys on the federal level that are trying to connect base with me. I've asked for a work group, not a committee, to begin that discussion on how we would build it up if we didn't have a federal government telling us how to run it. And then maybe by 16, elections go well, We'll have an opportunity to present that plan and have a pilot in Texas. Because if we can make it work for 26 million people today with the diversity we have, we can make it work anywhere. So I'm, I hope that we can do that. Public school finance, we can't fix without a constitutional amendment. If we're going to stay in a property tax system, our property tax system will not allow us to do anything than what we're doing today. Courts are going to rule on that. We're going to have a ruling probably by the end of the year, kind of like get a feel for what they're expecting out of us. But I don't see us being able to fix our property tax funding system mechanism for school without, without a constitutional amendment. You just can't get there from here. If you've got inequity in your values, no matter what, it's going to fix the inequity in the values. You still always have that inequity. So it just mathematically doesn't make sense. So that's going to be a challenge. Two out of three I can fix. 
that one's going to take some more. Fourth issue is federal overreach. Never before in the history of our country have we seen an administration, a federal government. You know, I tell people I love my country, but I really struggle to like my federal government right now. It's hard. <laughs> Uh, but of recent, August 29th, you guys are probably familiar with it since you're kind of in the groups, but the WOTUS Act, the uh, Waters of the United States, it's a derivative of the Clean Water Act from the 70s. It came through, it was going to go in on August 29th. There was a court in North Dakota that put an injunction on it that killed it on August 27th for those states that were in it. Texas was not in that lawsuit. And, and I've had questions why, but I haven't gotten good answers yet. So at the end of the day, what that act says and does, if you're a farmer or a rancher or anybody that's got water that puddles on your property, say you've got an old uh, creek bed, when it rains it's got water in it. There's a new term, uh, our illustrious Justice Kennedy came up with this. Scalia had an opposite opinion. Now they were both with the law, but they had a different definition. But something called significant nexus. Significant nexus was termed by Kennedy. Anytime Kennedy does something, it's probably not a good thing. And this term is so subjective and so broad that effectively if that pool of water can connect to a stream or tributary somewhere in the region, 100 mile floodplain was a tool or 4,000 foot is just crazy stuff, then that becomes subject to federal jurisdiction. Which means basically they will fine you $37,500 a day for not having a federal permit because that is a navigable water under that law. So where we're at today with that is Texas is now currently subject to that. A lot of states are, are, there's a lot of groups that are suing the federal government, suing the EPA, suing a lot of those processes. We hope to stall and push and stall and push and stall and push. The, the bad thing about the federal government is it moves real slow. The good thing about the federal government is it moves real slow. <laughs> So the odds of them being able to get things together and begin enforcement actions and some of that stuff before 16 when we can get some reasonable people in there, probably not good, but it's still a huge concern. Second act, nobody's talking about this one. You may have heard about it, but it's been out there for years. Texas was able to defer it in the June of 15. That passed, now it's here. Clean Power Act, Clean Power Plant, Clean Air Act, whatever you want to call it, CASPER regulations has the potential if it goes in, I think 16, 17, there's going to be a lot of action wrapped up on it. If it goes in, it will actually shut down potentially 50% of the coal field plants in Texas. Now, I understand the, the, the history here. Texas ratepayers have put $17 billion into clean field plants burning coal since 1999. The state of Texas took that initiative on without any help. They said, well, this is the right thing to do, 99. $17 billion of infrastructure paid through ratepayers. We meet, exceed, and have always exceeded EPA standards. We do today. We are actually better than the EPA standards today. But this is another federal power grab. You figure out, they can get your water, they can get your energy, they can get your banking, they can get your insurance. They pretty much got your life. So, this is one less animal in the, in the mix that they got to deal with if they can figure out confiscatory policy. That is a bad policy for us. You look at it, if you're 20% increase in your inputs for a producer that produces food and fiber, the consumer picks that up. The consumer's bill goes up, and before you know it, you've just systematically destroyed that $10 an hour person. That's the irony in all of this. This is all for clean air, and it's all to help people be better, but actually it's harming the ones that they advocate the hardest for, for more on top of It's the weirdest dynamic. It's sick. It's almost perverted. So that's, that's the second thing. Third thing we make lots and lots of jokes about. Lizards, minnows, and chickens. Chicken was removed off the endangered species last, last week. They, they, when rain comes, you get chickens. When rain comes, you get quiet. When rain's not here, you don't have either. I don't have to spend a lot of money to find out what happens to these animals. But I know that the moment today, I've seen probably three hatches of quail and I'll have quail in the freezer this year. I haven't had it since the drought. So it doesn't take a magician to figure out what's going on. So, with those three things, we have 172 more species that are in this region, in this area, in the fossil fuels production, and they will continue to be a target. They will continue to be a target. Big principle. Overall riding principle. Why are we in this mess on this level for that reason? Every one of those things I just talked about on the federal level, <coughs> every one of them, are agencies making laws. 
They had nothing to do with your, your Congress is letting them get away with it. Yep. Yep. And at the end of the day, your elected officials have negated their responsibility to make laws, and then they are supposed to delegate to the agencies rules and promulgate those rules for the laws to be implemented. But these agencies, and the EPA, number one on my list on these two acts that we just talked about, they're being sued, they're going to lose the lawsuits because they became a lawmaker and an advocate for the law. Agencies are not supposed to advocate for any laws. They rigged the system. They had a million calls come in, and they were playing games with the calls. They were monitoring calls. This agency's rogue. But there's a lot of rogue agencies, and the people you elect on the federal level are supposed to keep those in check. Let me give you an example in Texas. How many people in here like horse racing? I'm not anti-horse racing. No. I don't want gambling in Texas, but I'm not a big anti-anything on the horses. Racing Commission, a year ago, two years now, I guess, decided to make a law while we were out of session. They brought in historical racing, parimutuel betting for historical racing. It looks like a gambling machine. It is gambling. And we told them that's making a law. Do not do this. We're not in session. You can't do this. That's not a rule you should be in. And they went ahead and did it anyway. January this year, budget came out, zero money to Racing Commission. You don't think you get an agency's attention when you have zero money going to their line item? Power of the purse. That's how you control agencies. They came in, we had a heart to heart, we said, that's a law, You're not, your role is not to make a law, it's our role. Judiciary is to interpret the law whether it's constitutional, and the executive orders, branch has got veto power. Keep them separate. We keep our powers in Texas pretty separate. They disagreed, they went ahead. Up until last week, they were still pushing this historical racing. We had still left the money for administrative functions out of the budget. They finally figured out that the legislature was serious about the roads. It had nothing to do with horse racing for me. It had everything to do with telling an agency, that's not your role. It's my role. I'm the one elected and accountable to the voters, not some agency bureaucrat. They reneged, they pulled the, the video, historical racing, so that's no longer there. They got their money. We are lacking that at the federal level in a huge way. And you could turn the dynamics of this country on its head overnight if Congress would step up and use the power of the purse. It's just so simple to me, so obvious to me. I'm pretty simple minded. I came from Sweetwater, Texas. I still have got graduated you know, in 80, didn't ever see this coming. But that is the way the system was designed. And our federal guys need to hear it, hear it loudly that these agencies need to be reined in. When you zero out their budget on appropriations, you get their attention, you get that opportunity to begin to reign. That's the symptom of the overall. The other things we did in the session, very good. Uh, on the social end, I carried the, uh, probably the biggest pro life bill there was in the Senate side. We got that through as a judicial bypass for abortions. Closed up some loopholes that were being exploited. We put in the Pasture Protection Act. Uh, to protect pastors that are unwilling or against their liberty and conscience to be able to do same-sex marriage. That's out there protection that went in the law. Uh, kind of the bigger picture on budget. I get a lot of people saying, how's Texas going to fare? Barrel price doesn't come up. Here's the deal about barrel price. We figured $64 a barrel on average for the two-year bond end that's coming up. That was the comptroller's estimates. That'll probably be okay, but this Iran deal is the wild card. So if this Iran deal goes through, we could see $25 dollars I That means they will flood the market in spite of everything, just to, just to mess with us. And there is no bottom because they have an unlimited supply and their, their production costs as well. So that's the wild card. But just to kind of give you some comfort, we carried over some surplus dollars in Texas budget. It's really not a surplus. If I can talk to you about unfunded liabilities, it's not really real. But we have some flexibility to mitigate the downside of the oil industry for two years in this next binding. We should be okay. 86 session, session post that, if this old went to stay there protracted, low number, which history says it never does and never will. And I don't think the political end of this would run. Those people over there might can get into that range, but there's people over that country that need to eat. And it's a funny thing about how that works. If they get a little restless, then they'll raise prices to really eat. So I think there's some downside protection, but 86 is when we feel the real significance of a barrel price that does not come back up. So feel pretty confident next session will be okay. It won't be fun. If it doesn't move back up to that 64, we'll definitely have a little attrition. We'll start managing the state budget over the interim by deploying costs that we have discretion over. But, but we're all right for a couple 
for the next biennium? Uh, I think that's about it. There's, uh, I have since session, just since session's gone, been busy in them. Uh, we had chronic wasting disease hit the uh, Deer Breeders Association, first time in the history of Texas. That's basically mad cow disease for hoofed animals in the wild. Uh, Texas has a multi-billion dollar hunting industry where deer breeders, deer breeders have gotten into the deer breeding. For the first time in the history of the state, we had one of those cases show up in a breeding operation. Texas was Johnny on the spot. They got bright people doing great things. They show up at work. They don't ask for a lot, and they just were on it. We had protocols designed, implemented, and things going in our way in less than a 30-day period. Now, unfortunately, that disease is like rabies. You've got to kill the animal to test for it. This was one breeder operation down in Dean County, I believe it was. We had about 100 and some odd deer in the vicinity of the pens. I think we ended up exterminating 23. But then you got to think about if that deer has been bred, and it's tier one, tier two, how far out it went. So you have to figure out the protocols. But again, I'm so proud of the state because there really are smart people doing smart things that you'll never see or know that, that had that. I think we got, got it right. I think we're quarantined it, we're tweaking it. But that's a tough disease to get your feet around. Second thing that came through the session, you'll never know, but it's a big deal. Florida citrus industry, supposedly gone in 10 years. There's a greening kind of effect, a fungus kind of effect going on over there. Our uh, producers came to the committee and said, we can fix this, we need to get ahead of it, and I don't know how many guys are cop farmers, but Bow Weevil Eradication Program was a producer-led initiative that they put their money in to kill the <coughs> Same kind of initiative, we put the legislation in place to do that. So that's just kind of let you know there are things that just happen that you'll never know about that are good things that are being done. Third thing that kind of came up through this session, avian bird flu always hits Texas in the fall. We're already ahead of the next strain, but it's killed 40 million chickens up in the Northwest. But again, we just kind of have good people doing really smart things that way blows my mind in biology and all the things that go into food safety and stuff. Lots and lots of good things in Texas. We still function very well. We got our faults. We got challenges ahead. But we do a pretty good job in Texas because we still get it. It's not like the D.C. deal. So with that, I'll be glad to take questions. Yes, sir. <coughs> how, how much money did you say the, the state spent on border security? Oh, you heard it. The state spent. The state spent. <coughs> did we collect the federal gas tax and send it to the federal government? Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I hear you. I know the, the, the offset, the right of offset, uh, it doesn't exist. Now, let you, now let me tell you what I think happens in 16. If we had called, if, I'm sorry, if the administration had sent the National Guard, that was automatically their deal. Governor Perry called the National Guard, that became our deal. But what we have done as a state is paid time and a half on overtime for DPS and Texas Rangers and all of those. That is a legitimate reimbursable request. We won't get a dime from this group until he's out of there, but I do think the state of Texas, legitimately and rightfully so, should get the reimbursement of their employee workforce, and we'll make that request. Of course. Again. But that one, I think, is, is something. Can you know, DPS and the, the National Guard actually send anybody back, or they? They're there, but did they actually do anything? Uh, she asked if the DPS or the National Guard had the jurisdiction to send people back. The answer is no. Right. Border Patrol is the only one, or ICE is the only one that has the deportation uh, jurisdiction. Uh, people ask me all the time, is 800 money to me and well spent? And I can tell you, being down there three different times, the first time I went there, there was a drug bust in my hotel. And it was the most protected hotel in the area. There's 20 of us in there from the legislature. They had an iron cap. I mean, we were going through street lights, not stopping anywhere. Public didn't know we were there. Buses were blacked out. In my hallway outside my door that night, we had a drug bus. So, <laughs> so that's 2011. Uh, the, today, you can, with some confidence, walk the streets down in the border areas, border towns, uh, not on their side, but on our side, and feel fairly confident. I don't know how to recommend it, but it's, it's different. And I'll tell you, it's funny, I was debating a Democrat on the radio a couple of months ago, and he was beating me up about $800 million and how that's a waste. And he said, I was down there just two weeks ago, and I didn't feel unsafe at all. And I said, okay, point taken. I mean, you just made my argument. Yeah. It has been effective. It 
has worked here, <laughs> hard on the personnel. And uh, we are going to take the 800 million. And I've argued for some of that going to the sheriff's departments in the county. Up in Lubbock region, our county sheriffs are seeing bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, more pure meth, 100% pure, and 50 pounds is an average now, where five pounds was an average five years ago, 10 years ago. So there is a, a, an argument to be made that some of that gets through, you need to deal with it. So some of that money goes there. Most of that money is going to be hired, uh, used to hire 250 new DPS Texas Rangers. Now, you would think we could go out and find 250 people, but there's just a lot of people out there that can't qualify to be a DPS or a Texas Ranger. Uh, so we're, we're going to work through that, but that's where a lot of that money's going to go. So that we leave the troopers in the district. We were pulling the district. I mean, up in my area, it was not uncommon to have a trooper being gone 13, 15 times a year out of the district and be on the border operation. So that's what that's doing. So I hope we're looking at our military as they come back as the first option because those guys obviously probably would be a pretty ready-made labor force for that. But we're, we're looking at those options. Yes, ma'am. Uh, a little bit more about the navigable water, waterways. Why did we drop the ball? I mean, especially since water issues are so vital to us. And if you do the 100-year hundred flood plan and rig might can uh, speak to this, I would think most of this Angelo is in a 100-year flood plan. No, it's not. Pretty good part of it's not. Okay, well that's shocking to me because I feel like I'm in there. <laughs> so, so if, if, I've got river if, if we are, what happens to the municipalities that are, are affected by that? You know, like water catchment, so on, and is that? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer in a couple of ways. I think the municipalities will be exempted, obviously. This is going after private land owners. This, strictly, this, this strictly is pretty land. much a, an assault on private land owners. Uh, and they'll tell you that they're not going after ag and producers and those guys and ranchers and cattle. This is the same people that say cow farts are a bad thing for the environment, so you can't believe anything they say. I mean, that's truthful. That's the ludicrousy they legislate with. So I think it's strictly at that level. The municipalities already have their systems in place, and I don't think any of this was applied. But they go, they, they're tributaries, and yeah. they're, I mean. Well, like the Concho is a good example. Anything that can remotely be attached to Concho at any time during the time, you've now become under federal jurisdiction. I mean, it's, it's that invasive, it's that broad. So you've got to look back, and if you've had a hundred year flood, point something connected. You're, and, and so here, here's the practical side. How do you, how do you defend that? That's what They've got more attorneys. You can't. I mean, yeah. it's, it's an attorney thing. Uh, so, so that to say is, I don't think the municipalities are. As much as it, I'm still trying to figure out why Texas wasn't in the lawsuit. That's a huge. And, and, and really, and I, and I love this guy, he's a friend of mine, he's got his problems. Uh, I think politically, you know, they're going to be there, but it may be a distraction. I don't know when these lawsuits were filed. If they were filed five years back, ten years back, or there was a standing back then that you had to be in. I don't know the time frame or the chronological order of that. We dropped the ball or missed the ball. And if it was been in Abbott's tenure, I think we would have had an AG that would have saw that coming. Uh, and I'm not meaning I can, but somewhere in the mix here, something didn't happen. Uh, but they didn't seem to understand it either. I mean, I was doing a chicken dance week four last when that came out because I got a bill from his office saying, hey, you know, we, we prevailed, we prevailed. And then reading the Tribune. We weren't party to the suit. We weren't party at all. So. We're not. Now, that injunction does not. It came out subsequent to the ruling that if you were not part of that, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, you give it to 14 states, but you're going to ignore the other. So I think that's short term. We'll all be brought into it at once. And it's interesting that the point that's being sued on is an agency gone rogue, not the merits of taking private property, which is a scary thought. Your judiciary is not looking at the private property aspect as much as they're looking at the process in which it went through. And that scares me even more. Because that just shows that the judiciary is disconnected with private property issues. <laughs> I don't, I don't get it. So. What about, what about stuff like rain collection? You know, rain barrels and stuff like that. Because I, I don't think there's an issue with that. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know where that would work into that. This is strictly related to anything that can remotely connect in some capacity across the land. So that's, 
that's all it was. Senator Perry, you you said a while ago about Congress is supposed to, to help rein in these rogue agencies. And, and I agree with that. However, I feel like the state, our state line, should play a big role in that too. So I'd like to know how our state intends, or do they intend to stand strong and, and not accept any federal overreach into this sort of thing? Yeah, we're fighting it. I mean, except for not being in that court case, Texas has a pretty good track record pushing back on all of those things that don't make sense. We were successful. I think Abbott says he gets up every day to suits the federal government and then he goes to bed at night and gets up to suits the federal government. I think he was successful in those. So we will continually push back through that process. That's to do. And here's what I would like to see. If a state has a legitimate agency that's handling those issues, TCEQ comes to mind. Love them, hate them. I believe they do a pretty good job. They seem to be pretty common sense, pretty balanced in their approach. The current commissioner of that is, I, I think he's a gem. Because I can sit in front of him across the desk and say, here's the practical application of this out in my area. This, this $8 million to take out arsenic or fluoride in the water, nobody wants to drink arsenic fluoride, but they've been drinking it for 300 years. That standard's been lowered where it's not realistic. And they say, okay, let's see if we can't read out that. But that mandate came from feds. So what I think makes the most sense is for our Congress guys to say, if the state has a, state has a history and, and a compliance and has done well with what they've been given the responsibility over, EPA has no jurisdiction. Because I think all of us in here want some assurances that people aren't pouring chemicals in the water. I think most people don't want the old law offer to have chemicals dumped in it and running for 14 states or whatever. So that's where the TCQ does, and that's where the state of Texas needs to always be. We got our own solution. We do a good job, and we need to just be left alone. And that's where I think the state's argument has to go in the future. And that's where I think we need to advocate, hopefully in 16 with a different makeup, that you need to leave the states out of this anymore. If, you know, for EPA can work for those states that don't have the resources to have their own EPA, that's okay. But when Texas shows that it's got the resources and a very responsible, that's where we need to argue. That's how you win those arguments. Well, which one has got the most power the states or the government? <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you how it's supposed to be. Well, I can see a poor state and need the government to help them out, but we're not a poor state. Here, here's, here's the crutch of your question. He asked who's got more power, state or the feds. Look. It was designed for the states to have total power. So what I would say, if a state chooses, to use the EPA, let it be their choice. If the state says, we can do it on our own very, very well and have proven that, I mean, the TCEQ's record on this issue is noxious gas and stuff and takes outstanding. Actually, people look to ours and say, we want to be like them. So if Texas ought to be able to say, we don't need you. We got it done. Thank you. So again, it's the inverse of what's going on now. It's Fed saying, you will, and the state should say, we can we might if we choose to. And that's what we like to be the leaders. We want to build government to help all the people that we can. Right. And if they take that from us, now they're, they're depending on the, the government instead of, of the own work that we have here. So uh, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's, I, it, I just retired myself about three months ago from the Navy. And uh, it feels good to be back in San Angelo. Thank you for your service. I, mean, I was a chaplain there, so I had a lot of battles myself. But, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of things going on with the veterans coming in here. And uh, Texas will take care of the veterans. But right. there's many things. One thing I found out there at the end is that there's called a survivor benefit plan. I don't know if you're familiar with that. What that is is it takes your pension. If I died right now, three months later, none of my family would get any of the pension that I have. And uh, so I don't know. Y'all might be able to work with the veterans up there, so in that way, the pension would go to their family. And instead of paying $300 a month, which I had to opt out of that part. But there's there's many things, I guess, what they were cutting in, in the areas that we don't see. But we need somebody up there at least uh, to be able to take care of our own families. So yeah. if I put that right now, nobody would have anything. Yeah, and, and, and it's all federal on the veteran side. It's all federal. But, but let me ask this I mean, I'm going to beg off because I don't have an understanding of the veterans' plan on that deal, but I would ask this question and you ought to follow up. 
almost being a CPA, you know, got tax returns to do tonight. Yeah. Um, every pension plan out there has what's called a survivor benefit election, which you tell up front that I'm willing to take a little less for today so that my family can receive something if I die. And you pick it either 10, 25, 50%, 25%. I don't know if that's available in the veterans. Is it? No. Mr. Bacon is saying it is. So you might call, and it's just a matter of you checking the box. My wife, retired teacher in the retired teacher's plan, she elected up front either to take a little less knowing that I would receive a portion of her money if she died going forward. So you need to follow up, and the question to ask is, is what is the survivor benefit election form, and can you send it to me? Because I do think it's available. It's uh, $300, $300 a, a month that we would have to pay, and then what they would receive is one half of my pension. Okay. And yeah. so we would get a life policy for a million dollars for that, so. so but that's, that's and I'm just thing. saying, I think it's available. But I, I, I'm just not intimately familiar with the Veterans Benefit Package, but I know as a practicing CPA, that's always a discussion. So, yeah. and, the, and the answer is if you can live without a little less than the day, then you, you, you take a little less. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, let me tell you, thank you for that. I, I forget sometimes. We have seven of props to coming up in November. Seven props to vote on. I don't know a reason you wouldn't vote for all of them. Prop seven is about putting $5 billion into the road infrastructures in Texas without raising your taxes. What we did is we took what was being diverted. Your gas tax was not all going to roads and bridges. So we put the money in the general fund to leave that in Prop 7. Additionally, we said going forward, the sales tax when you buy a vehicle, six and a quarter, up to a certain point, we'll leave that in the general, but over and above that, that'll go straight to roads and bridges. So if you buy cars, going to the roads and bridges. So it's a way to get $5 billion into the road infrastructure in Texas. We, we desperately need that. We've outgrown our road infrastructure on some level. So we get that money in there. I have full confidence in the Colonel that is running the TxDOT department agency now. If you get a chance to hear him speak and go talk to him, the guy's in it, he's on it, he's engaged in it, he calls me back at 9 or 10 at night. That's a, that's a guy that's got just as many people pulling on him as I do. So I'm really encouraged by a guy that gets it. He wants the money to be on the roads. But that's Prop 7. Prop 1 is a um, increase in your homestead exemption from the current 10000 to twenty five. $15,000 increase. You're not going to see the results of that. If I had my way, it was king for a day, I would have doubled down on the money for franchise or paid debt or paid unfunded liabilities off. I'm not king for a day. It's a process that went to homeowners, which I'm all for saving taxes, but unfortunately with appraisal creeps and property tax values and things, you won't see much of it. But it is a significant decrease by $15,000 in your bank. From now to eternity. So that, that's problem one. It's when we don't get though, because our school board does not know. Your school board doesn't. So no, that's no. a that's a local issue. So you can you can you can get them after them. But property taxes are a problem. I have looked at them. I've tried to figure out a better way. Consumption taxes stuff. It is a complicated problem. So we we got to kind of go back and rework. In my opinion, we need to come prepared to deal with some of that. We got to kind of rework. Uh, another prop that's in there, it's, uh, I had 62 bills in my office. 27 were my personal, 35 of them came from the house I sponsored. That's a pretty big bill load, especially for a freshman center to get out. But I was pretty good at getting it. Most of them are rural initiatives. One of those rural initiatives, if the county's out there doing work in your neighborhood and you're in a county 5,000 below, and you've got a culvert that's leaking that's on your private property, if you're under 5000 you could ask the county to fix it and pay them for that. You wouldn't have to call a service from 200 miles out and pay road time, travel time, hourly rates and stuff. Well, this particular county in my district had a prison that put them over 7500 or up to 7500 So the bill, Prop 5, I think it is, is 7500 limit on that to allow the county to do work, be reimbursed in the, in the road area. So it's a good bill. Uh, that's my second constitutional amendment in three terms. I don't know what that says about it. Uh, the first one's a veteran's benefit, a good benefit. There's another veteran's benefit on the props. 
if a surviving spouse, uh, a disabled vet dies or a vet dies, the surviving spouse gets the property tax exemption, it transfers over until they remarry a non-vet and some other things. But good, good amendment. One of them people need to kind of understand, um, one of them is to give a statewide official the opportunity to not maintain a house in Travis County, except for the governor. The governor still has to live in Travis County. But your lieutenant governor, your comptroller, your ag commissioner, some of those guys, they're required to maintain a house in Travis County. Well, they get paid decent, but when you're trying to maintain two houses, and it's just not really economically feasible to require that up with technology. They're there to do their job, and they're there to do it when they need to be there. They're most time, they're kind of like me, statewide travel. They travel all over the state. So practically speaking, it's not fair to ask them to have a separate house, and that's what that prop does. It says they're not required to, they can, but it takes the requirement off the lieutenant governor, uh, comptroller, and those guys to physically reside in Travis, because, you know, they, their wife's still back at the other house. This was an elected position. They may not get reelected. So <laughs> they didn't throw everything to the wind and say, I'm in Austin for my life. So that's one. Uh, I'm not familiar with the others, just right off the top of my head. But they're all, in my opinion, yeses. I'll vote for yeses. But thank you for that question. Others? Questions? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I may know the answer to this, but probably everybody in the room does. but. When I read that little newspaper article, I read those kind of things, we know what's going on. Our president's trying to destroy our country. Why is Congress letting him get away with this, everything he's doing? I, I don't have an answer. I have a lot of I'm worried about it. I, money. I don't know if it's, uh, I don't know if it's money. I don't know if it's ignorance. You would be shocked. You would actually be shocked how many people do not understand our form of government. And so you are elected people that go into the congressional setting that don't understand states' rights or premier or federal rights. That we are the government and we create the government. So you, and there's an ignorance in that. So I think it's one, it's ignorance. Two, I think it's power. You know, there's 17,000 lobbyists up there and every one of them want to come by and talk to you and every one of them want to help. And they're not all bad. I use them for resources. They're good information sources. But you got to keep them in their box, too. But I think it's power and money. I know there's a handful of people up there that try to get it right. But I really think, honestly, it's a loss of how our, how our system is designed to function. Because if you, if you get that right, you can pretty much make good decisions. It's, it's the agencies gone wrong. It's state rights versus federal rights. It's all of those things that gone. We've just gotten away from our heritage our history and we're having revisionist history and we're having rewriting. I have no problem with rewriting of the history to include a fact to make it clear. I have a real problem with revisionist history that chooses what it takes out and leaves in. That's a dangerous trail we're on that. Uh, one other thing I've done since last session, interim, uh, since interim started, <coughs> Planned Parenthood hearings in HHSC, my committee, Health and Human Services, I served on that, criminal justice, higher ed, and then chairman of the water. We had a committee on Planned Parenthood. I've asked for all funding, all funding, to be stopped at the state level until this quagmire mess has been settled. I have not gotten a response back from the Health and Human Services guy yet. They're researching. There's three pro In my freshman session, I filed an amendment, $64 million that effectively <coughs> gutted Planned Parenthood. That was the bill that did it. I had the amendment that allowed it. Uh, subsequent to that, we still have some programs that are connected to Planned Parenthood, non-abortion, no abortion services. That said, we're, I'm, two of those are pure state dollars. I want those shut at all. There's not hardly any money in there. Uh, so it's not a lot of money, but it's the principle. I just haven't gotten it done yet. But that's where that committee is going. And it's, since, since there's a criminal investigation ongoing, you got all the attorneys involved. So we've kind of lost our ability to push a lot of the agenda until they get that but to answer to your question, I obviously don't know what motivates someone to do what or not do. I don't know. Well, that, to sum up my question, I'll make a statement. I never dreamed I'd wake up one morning and find out my federal government is my worst enemy. And our founding fathers were uh, very prophetic in their predictions. 
uh, tell everybody go read Noah Webster and Jefferson. Jefferson says an uneducated populist, uninformed populist can't govern. And Noah Webster says if you elected more people, you gave them more laws. So I mean, those two together pretty much sums <coughs> up the state of the state of affairs, right? We've gotten away from a lot of things, and we've allowed it to happen. Senator Curry, it seems like the, the Senate was a lot more conservative in its actions than the House. Can you just highlight some of the legislation that y'all read was sent over to the House, and then what happened to it? Why it wasn't enacted? One that comes to mind is the sanctuary cities was one, and uh, another show several other. Bill yeah, Sanctuary City bill is mine. It's already got the votes to go back. Next session will be probably one of the first bills I've filed. <clears throat> so that won't get through. We have already, I've got the 20 votes to do that today. Uh, and I think I have 21. So that will get through. Why it didn't get through was Republicans in the Senate. That wasn't a House thing. That was a Senate thing. <coughs> Two Republicans that refused to vote for it. So that's where that got stopped. Huh? Who were they? Who were they? Uh, Kevin Altai, and he... I love him to death, but his logic was so flawed. He said that is a local control matter. Now, we're talking federal and state immigration law. So I guess under his rule, if I don't want to pay federal income taxes, that would be a local control issue by the mayor. So I, I can't get there from here. So I think he was wrong in his logic. He's not coming back. Uh, Brian Hughes, great guy. I'm, I'm, I'm already out there with him. So Brian Hughes, I hope, is a guy who should by all accounts win that seat. Second guy was uh, Craig Exton's Wichita Falls. He just was convicted that that was just not the right law. Now he subsequently changed his tune since we've had numerous killings going on. So uh, that was just about rule of law. That's all that bill is. It has nothing to do with skin color or, or status. It was about a law of the books and are we going to enforce law of the books or are we not? Because when you have a system that says, well, enforce it here and not there, you end up with Ferguson. You end up with anarchists and chaos. So we have to have law, or we don't. It's just a picket, but we can't be in between. But back to your question, I'll tell you something we did do in the Senate that hasn't happened in our recent past, and we can't really find out where it could happen at all. We sent a budget over, less than 2% growth in each year, so under 4% growth for the buying, first one, population inflation. Second thing is we sent a budget over, and through conference, because of Jane Nelson's and her strength, it came back a billion dollars less than what we sent over. Mm -hmm. Now, every time you ever send a budget over to one or the other chamber, it does nothing but move up from there. So, Senate was pretty good on that account. Uh, several bills kind of came up and went through the, uh, the school voucher bill, whether you agree or disagree, that did go out of the Senate. It did, it died in the House. Uh, I, I, there's numerous ones, but it was just, it was that dynamic. There's just a different dynamic in the House. American law for American courts. Yeah, didn't even get here. Why? Uh, well, that with Texas, other states. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. My uh, Article Five didn't get any ground, uh, and that's another one I'm serious about. I, you know, I, I hear these town halls, and our founders knew human nature being what it was that at some point there needed to be a safety net. Article Five is the safety net. So. I'll follow Article 5 again, and I think we'll have some traction. I'm trying to get some other states to rally now. You don't have to actually do it. You just have to show that you're motivated to have some momentum to do it. Uh, but that law didn't have a hearing. It was a, you know, here's what I'll say about Dan Patrick, and I, and I think he did a masterful job, especially in his first leadership role like that. He was very consistent. He came in and said, the Senate is going to be ran by senators, and the chairmen are going to run the committees. I will not micromanage and on that account, that particular piece of legislation was in a committee setting that the chairman of that committee did not want to have to go through that battle. She just didn't want to have it in her committee. Bad or good or indifferent, but the lieutenant governor was consistent and he stuck to that. I'll give you one example. Hayes County, massive water issue. I told Patrick, I said, I don't know what I've done to make you mad to make me water chair. That'll be the most consistent, I mean, the most contentious issue we have in state. He laughed. He's from Harris. They got water. About two months into it, he said, this is the most contentious issue I've got. So <laughs> he came around pretty quick. But on that note, we had an ongoing battle. If you can come up previous sessions that I got to deal with this session. It was on the water rights issue. A particular area had sold it, or a particular landowner had sold its water rights to a 
developer to develop water for two or three cities in the region. He's not under a water district. It's his to sell. It was with no restraint. That's the way it is. That's the Texas law. Well, the legislature was asked to bring in a water district that was effectively going to overlap that decision, undo that contract, undo all the money that had been spent, all the wells had been drilled, nothing was going to happen. And I said, I can't do that. I said, that's not, that's number one, that's not good law. Number two, that violates everything I know about private property and contract. And we're not going to do that. So Patrick came in and said, I'm getting blown up. My phone's blowing up. People are mad. People are angry. They're coming in here. They're raising cane. He said, I don't understand what you, what you need to do. I said, well, I've got transition money, which it says they can come in under the district, but you're not going to get to exclude what they've already done, and it'll kind of incorporate transition language. He said, I don't know what the law is. I don't know what the law should be. Let me get back to you after my legal team reviews your decision. He came back that Monday. That was a Friday. He came back Monday. He said, I'm with you. I agree with you. You're right on the principle. You're right on the law. And if you don't want to let that bill out of your committee without that language, you can keep it. So that's leadership because that was not a popular thing to do. Yeah. And that is not something, I don't, that's not something that that Senate had had in a long time. So it made it very easy to be a senator in the Senate when you knew that guy was going to stand with you on things that mattered that were right or controversial. Right. So when he didn't let that bill, when he didn't go to that chairman and say, you got to let that out, I respected him for it because that was consistent with what he had done with the other folks. And you got to have that, you got to have that style. Things we don't ever hear. You, you all, yeah. I try to give you the insider baseball. I'll tell you anything that's going on. All in all, I love the Senate. Uh, it's, 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 I was told it was better and different. It, was, it is better. You are an all in one. And uh, the good thing is, is you can move an agenda. The bad thing is, you can move an agenda. So, <laughs> so you better be moving it in the right direction with all your eyes dotted and T's crossed or you can get something screwed up. That's why you rely on the house sometimes to kind of kick back that thing. It's a great process. Our family father are free. Yeah. We just stay with what they do. Others? Why do we not see more, sorry, no, go ahead. more pushback from the states against the federal government? I mean, you don't ever hear about anybody nullifying any regulations or you just don't hear about the pushback but that we ought to be hearing about. The pushback's going on. There are lawsuits pending. There are groups in the state that are suing on the, you know, part of that standing issue I think goes back to there was probably a judge that picked up claimants. I don't know if the state itself had it. Since it's individual property rights, I don't know what the state stands, uh, standing for. It. So, but there are those ongoing issues that we do. Uh, we pushed back with Medicaid expansion. We said no. Now, those states that said yes, if you recently, Wall Street Journal article a few months back said, we wish we had it, because now they're seeing their state budgets go boom. And these are states that a billion dollars is in their budget, that's it. I mean, these are small states that are seeing this explosion, and it's going to kill them. And we knew that as a state, because we knew what was coming, and, it, and, it, and it, it, it's going to take, take some of those states down. So we do those things, and it's just not something you see in the press for the right reasons, saying why we did it. You should say, we're just starving people to death or whatever. So there's, there's an ongoing push. And I think this administration, it's pretty clear he has no respect for the process. He has no love for this country. I have great Democratic friends. We all love this country. We have a different process of maybe helping it, different attitude. But the guy in the White House, I can tell you, unequivocally, his, his fruits are he hates this country. And I'll say it in public air every time I get a chance because it's pretty clear he has a disdain for this country. But I can tell you my Democrats in Texas legislature don't. We're, we're pushing back. I think the Article 5, as much as, as controversial as that thing is, even amongst our groups, our conservative groups, I think it is an answer to, to waking up some folks at the federal level. Because there's a lot of them up there don't even know it exists. Well, the question nobody's going to ask but me. <laughs> what about the, the deal in Kentucky with the lady and we have the mm -hmm. Molly Crider yeah. here who would not have uh, yep. issues of gay rights? I mean, She's right. Uh, Kim Davis is right. And for those that advocate her stepping down, she shouldn't have to step down. Um, is and there that, anything going on to 
You will see legislation in the next session for business protection. The county clerks, that's a different animal. Those are government employees. Yeah. But you should not put someone in jail for standing up. <coughs> uh, and she shouldn't be asked to leave that either, in my opinion. Um, you know, there's, there is a point where you got God's law and you got man's law, and you would hope that they run parallel pretty easy. But if they ever cross, you got to go with the higher law. And, and, and you know, you saw like 100,000 people today, I think, was showed up for. Uh, that's, where, that's where you start to see the Davids and the Goliaths and the Davids and stuff show up. And she's right. And it's not right because of a hatred for a particular group of people. She's right because that is God's law. <laughs> and we've got to get back to that. And, and I'm not going to wear it out there on my shoulder and be able to push that off in people's face. But on those issues, when we're, when we're asked to make those decisions, she made the right decision. So. But Texas will continue to have this ongoing debate. The ramifications of that, real simply, you're going to see public school systems coming to you for bond elections to have transgender restrooms. Yeah. I mean, it's just crazy for this thing. I've heard that the difference between an optimist and a pessimist is that the pessimist is just better informed. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time during the day just taking in news and data and information, and I, I'm, I'm pretty well informed and tend to be relatively pessimistic. I want to say that it's been a real encouragement for you to come and share with us tonight to give us a glimpse on what's going on there and some of the needs there. My excitement of my heart is that, that Texas takes its rightful place among the states. And the Founding Fathers talk about America taking its rightful place among the nations. And we were able to do that. Uh, as far as things being etched in stone, Sodom and Gomorrah is something that comes to mind as far as something that's etched in stone. So the consequences of, of these issues have the potential of being really catastrophic. And uh, thank you for coming. No, I, I want to leave you on encouragement. I, I can talk to Pierce about some really big issues that really make me lose sleep at night. Uh, our unfunded liabilities at the federal government and at the state level are honestly probably, truth to matter, just economically can't, can't get there from here. But, you know, that's projecting out 75, 100 years. Well, I don't know. If we're, I don't know what we're going to look like in 75, 100 years. I do know this. If our federal government got out of the way and put a growth package together that would allow growth of about 4 to 6 percent, which is extremely aggressive, extremely aggressive, <coughs> inflation would be an issue in that mix. But at the end of the day, we need an economic policy that reinvigorates the country. <coughs> I'm not a protectionist, but I also think. We're independent oil and energy, at least on the short term, to do what those guys want to do to us to shut them down because we don't buy their oil. China quits buying their oil. They go down. So there's there's some arguments for just global national policy. But I will say this one. All is not lost if we quit electing people on personal agendas and pocketbooks. And that means everybody in this room, and me included, have some sacrifices coming. And if we'll do that, this country's got a history and a bright future. If we don't do that, it's still got a history and a bright future. But it, it's going to be a painful process when it does come down. And so I think we're going to get there. I do tell people it's time to pray like you've never prayed before. I was talking to you back there in the back, but I use this analogy. It's a two-way street. More unfulfilled answer prayers occur because it's a two-way street. Point being, be prepared what you're asked to do to go do it. I use the analogy of the guy standing on top of the house and the water floods rising and they send a life jacket, a boat, and a helicopter by the drowns. So God, why didn't you do something? You know, he had an answer prayer there three different times. He just didn't act. <laughs> so it's time to begin that process of getting back to what he is now. You know, he's done a masterful job of devising divisiveness. Uh, throughout history, the bad guys find somebody to hate. For the first four years, and this is not meant to be racist, it's not a racist comment, it was white guys with a job and success. The last two years, it's been people with a gun and a badge. And that's just wrong. And I'm telling you, it's designed to, to divide and conquer. 
We're a nation of separated classes, separated groups, individuals. We have no national unity of pride in this nation. We get through 16, we begin that process of rebuilding because rural law matters. We'll support those people that support that, and we'll fill this back up, but it's going to be a tough 16. I think 16 is going to be a pivotal year on a lot of levels, economically and other things. But, but, but that's exactly <coughs> what he went out to do, and he's been successful in doing it in a very short amount of time. He has not come out as a national leader against what's going on against our men, but we're the uniform, no. and he should because he created that monster with the DOJ that, that, that exasperated at every opportunity. So they showed his cards. We all knew they were there. He played them. I don't know what his good bra is going to be. This Iran deal, talk to you a little bit about that. Everybody in this room understands how devastating that is. If our Congress does not find every stall tech in the world for impeachment, what are, it is treasonous to aid and abet your known enemies. I don't know how very clearly you can define your enemy when he sets across the table and says, our job is to kill you. I don't know how much more clear you were building the bombs to do it with as the talks are going on. But $150 billion to that group is equivalent to $3 trillion of our economy. That's the impact $150 billion will have. It will effectively erase all of the economic sanctions that have been going on and, and, and totally put them back in the players. So there's no other name for it than trees. Any more questions? One more question, and I'll give you my... Uh, Texas, we have a lot of talk with divorce. And uh, a lot of other states, they have what you call legal separation. And uh, so it gives two people time to build and work things out and everything. How come Texas doesn't have a you have legal that. separation? You know, divorce is, is... There's no fault divorce, which in my opinion has been way overused. Uh, there's some covenant marriage legislation and stuff coming up, but you can legally separate without a court action. You can do that. There's that, that process. Two people can't get along today. They go off and do their thing for a while. They're still married. I mean, so that's already available. The practice is already available. <coughs> covenant marriage legislation, we'll see that come back. And it's not to force you into a bad marriage or stay in a bad marriage. And, and heaven forbid, if you're an abusive one, you need to be out of it. But it is to kind of give a process of hopefully trying to trying to handle some of those different Yes, we have to work things out. So we do have uh, what you call uh, legal separation. Yeah, I mean, it's just two people that say, I want to separate in Texas. They just go separate. Yeah, yeah, they can do that. But I believe in other states, they can take care of things so that they are not worried about uh, yeah. legal. legal well, then the lawyers behave as they already did. <laughs> so, you know. I just um, try to work through a lot of different areas. I Yes. I think it is Brazil where they have to wait a year after they filed for divorce before the divorce goes through. And I think that uh, the reconciliation rate is like 80%. Yeah. And I, and I counsel people as a CPA all the time. Grass isn't greener, trust me. I've seen both sides. Uh, when you come into my office, I can tell you that you think you're going to have a better life, but I've seen the other side when you get out of here, you're not. So I do a lot of that counseling. But I do agree this idea that I can go in and in 30 days or 60 days it is, you're out. That's too short. It's too short. I have to be careful with that because sometimes people are in just in situations absolutely devastating. So. I have a question that's totally different from anything Good. that's been discussed. And they will appreciate it. <laughs> Well, uh, I know a large portion of our state budget goes to welfare, food stamps, uh, rent subsidy, helping, right. which I don't have a problem with that, but there is so much fraud going on in that. Is there anything, anyone, committee, whatever in place to address that, to try to find out, to see what's going on? 17% yeah, of the Medicaid budget is fraud. And I'll give you perspective, that's about $3 billion right off the bat that could be probably pulled in. We have a process. We have very active investigators. I have proposed legislation for software uh, investigation and analytics and some other things. So there's somebody always working on it. About $3 billion is best on the Medicaid side. On the food stamps, that's, that's all federal dollars. That's 85% of that money is pretty much federal dollars. And there's fraud there. I think if we I push for this, it doesn't get anywhere. We need a photo ID or a fingerprint, mm -hmm. fingerprint pretty much, on the Lone Star cards. That would shut out the fraud like that. So the state won't do it, but I'm pushing for it. The cost of doing the cards is expensive. But. There are several states that have passed legislation to 
drug test welfare recipients is Texas looking at it? Yeah, I think all comes up every session. I've actually looked at it. Here's the deal. Florida did it. They get it unconstitutional. Here's the problem. Entitlement means you're breathing. You don't have to qualify. If you're just breathing and you meet a couple of criteria, you get it. So the minute they did that, there was a constitutional challenge and they lost it. So you lose that over time. Second thing is, I dug into it. Because really, the, my emphasis was, is we've got drug-affected welfare recipients. We've got plans in the state to help people get out of that. So there's a source over here, so that was the way of identifying. I dig, there's, it's not tracked, number one. That is not tracked. Now, I did pass a bill that if you're on unemployment and you can't pass a drug test, you lose your unemployment with so I did get that done, because that doesn't make sense, because the employers can't have you if you're not drug free. But on that issue, so the only thing I could come up with that would give me some perspective of how big of a problem that is was I went and pulled the data for 2011 for all the opiate born addicted babies, meaning their moms were on drugs when they got pregnant or had the baby. I was shocked there was only 1,800 kids in the state with all the Medicaid births for 2011. So I don't know how big of a problem it is. I think it's a bigger problem than that indicated because CPS workers will tell me that probably 95% of their cases are addicted to alcohol or abuse or something. So I think it's a bigger problem than that. We can't win that argument unless you kind of come at it from probable mm -hmm. cause. If, if you go at that person as a probable cause that they're users versus a Medicaid recipient, because the minute you go Medicaid recipient, the Constitution just blows you up. So that's a different way of attacking it. I've got a representative that I love it. It's going to investigate that aspect and see if that's a better path. But unemployment beneficiaries can't get them, uh, can't get them if they're on drugs. Cool. So, well, that's good. Yeah, that's my bad. Okay. Well, I'm going to get on the road. I do have a door. Let's, uh, let's give a round of applause. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Stay engaged. You know, I see a little bit of I, this gentleman back here. I see people feeling a little defeated. We're defeated when we quit. That's the key. Can you hang around a little while? Yes, uh, Just I, about five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, Deborah, did you want to expand on that city limits? Oh, uh, well, I and I attended a, a meeting in Austin. Um, It was about the uh, forced annexation in the state of Texas. There's a lot of, of, especially the larger cities, but it doesn't mean that it couldn't happen here, that are taking over a lot of land and annex annexing a lot of property um, with people who don't want to be annexed. They moved, or they moved outside of the city for that reason, to get out of the city. But there's a lot of uh, pushback now going on and hopefully we'll be able to, to make put an end to the forced annexation. The reason that they, of course, and right now, right now in uh, San Antonio, they're about to annex, I believe it's 66,000? 240,000. 240? There's two of them. 240,000. The video is on the cover of the Christian Reporter News from that meeting. Okay. Yeah, if you want to go and look at the video, uh, it's on the... Christian Reporter News website, but uh, right now there's just a really big push, and of course the, the reason they're doing it is for the money, for the tax money that they're not getting right now from those areas, but um, they are trying to push back on that. There's not going to be anything they can do about San Antonio. It's probably going to go through, and they're not going to be able to do anything to stop that, but we need to put a stop to it in these other cities. Yeah, there we might add it. 28 states require votes in these yeah. areas that are to be annexed. These people have to vote. Texas doesn't allow a vote. So I think that there was legislation that was maybe last Yeah, I think Concourse or Campbell, but Concourse, I think. Yeah. Uh, Campbell and so. Huberty were working on it. So so that, would that, would, that would come back. Yeah. That would be another run at that. Yeah, I think that TPPL, the yes. group, I think they're working on some refined language, some of the, some of the Concerns during the session that didn't let that get out. I think they're going to have those addressed. That's what we go through. 
I didn't introduce Pam Dutton. For those that don't know her, she is my staff here in San Angelo. If you need anything, call her, get a hold of her. She knows where to find me. Some of y'all got my cell phone, we need to use it. <laughs> okay, you have to take off right now? I, I need to be getting on the road pretty He's, well. You're going back to Lubbock tonight, yeah. correct? Okay. Well, we're just going to uh, buy you supper. No, I'm not eating. Thank you for coming. Thank you for